Hello, I'm Les Miller. Today we're going to talk about fate versus free choice and bounce around some ideas from these two supposedly paradoxical opposing thoughts. Are we robots? Or if God does exist, is he somehow powerless to interfere with society as history plays out? Two polar extremes looking for a balance in the middle. I was inspired to make this video because of one of several channels that I like to watch when I am in the mood for just basic secular entertainment, and that is Alternate History Hub. It's a kind of thing that you see a lot in science fiction movies and videos and TV shows. You go back in time, you make a change, all of a sudden things are different now. It's called the Grandfather Paradox. It came about as a result of the theories of relativity put forth by Albert Einstein and the idea of time travel. Very popular again in science fiction. Lots of channels like this on YouTube. But as far as the best one, I think it is the one by Cody, Alternate History Hub. His stuff is just so well thought out, so logical, so interesting to think about. I'm speaking in particular to several of his videos on the U.S. Civil War, what if the Confederates had won, and we'll also be mixing in a little bit from the War of 1812 and um, a few others as well, but just batting basically around the idea in general. So history, how can we understand the flow of history in a simple illustration? I like to think of it like a river going around a large rock. In the life of an individual or in the life of a nation, if you make a choice, if your country makes a choice that it should not have made, that was a mistake, eventually, as history plays out, you'll come around to some version of where you would have been if you had made the right choice instead. Just as water goes around a large boulder on both sides when it's flowing in a river. History as well, another philosophical approach to it, To me, the monarch butterfly and its um, migratory pattern. The same butterfly that left Toronto in the spring is not the butterfly that arrives in Mexico for the winter. It's literally a multi-generational process. To me, this is a great thought on the idea of someone being needing to be there to guide history. It can't just be all up to chance, and yet we can't be robots either, or there's no point in life. I know there's an entire branch of Christianity called Calvinism that teaches this idea, once saved, always saved, predetermination, predestination, they call it. It just can't be true. Otherwise, the Bible would not use the word if, now would it? And outside Christianity, because there's multiple different thought systems that exist out there that kind of have a same idea when they use words like fate, or you'll hear the phrase, what comes around goes around, right? These are basically non-Christian ways of saying the same idea. So let's draw from some of Cody's videos and make some comments ourselves here. The War of 1812. He did a great video, and I'm glad he had the courage to say that it was a stalemate because everybody here in Canada and a lot of people in the U.S., that both sides claim they won the war, but really it was a stalemate. Well, if God was in it, why did it happen? How could it have happened? What purpose could there have been for it? Well, think about this. When, when historians look back on, a, on an event and they see a positive outcome to it, a meaning to it. Could that possibly be God's will for any one point in history? And maybe that's what happened in 1812. After the Revolutionary War, the Empire Loyalists left, they moved north into what is now Canada, and that animosity on both sides existed for that whole generation. They raised their children in that animosity. And there's a great video, a short little animated one on the channel History Matters, where they talk about how it was a century-long process to diffuse that animosity. 
really the War of 1812 was inevitable in one sense, but also it was necessary. It started the process off for the U.S. and Canada and the British Empire, the British, to become friends. For us here in Canada, it was a turning point in the sense that this was when we began our journey toward a national identity of our own. We began to identify ourselves as Canadians for the first time when we faced this enemy together. And to me also, I think it gave tooth to the Monroe Doctrine. I did some research on that, found a video on the channel Khan Academy, watched it, and their take was that the Monroe Doctrine was basically toothless and that it was the Royal Navy, the British Navy, that made the Monroe Doctrine stick with the rest of the world. Well, I don't think so. I think that there was a psychological message that was sent to Europe when the U.S. held its own against the mighty British Empire twice, and that that's why the Europeans didn't try to get their colonies back as their colonies were rebelling. Think about it. When did Spain try to get back the Dominican Republic? During the Civil War. So, this is a thought, this is evidence that, yes, they had understood after 1812 that the U.S. was not to be messed with. And to me, I think that it did really make a major contribution to not only American history, but to the history of the entire North and South American continents. Now, again, are we robots? What about free choice? Well, I'm going to give some examples now from my own particular denomination, and that is Seventh-day Adventist. Let's go over to the couch and do them there. I wanted to bring Oreo watch my videos one last time. He was with me in my very first video, How to Study the Bible. It's on the Les Millman channel and was in a number of videos through that initial series of video Bible studies that I did for my local church. I just wanted to show them off to my friends one more time. Anyway, you go sit down, Ori. There you go. History. There you go. For a secular background on what we're going to talk about here, please watch the video the Battle of Bull Run Explained on the channel Mr. Beat. He does a very good job, very succinctly describing an event during the U.S. Civil War that I'm going to talk about now. And also for a more in-depth spiritual angle on this same discussion, it's Ellen White's Amazing Vision, need my reading glasses, Ellen White's Amazing Vision of Civil War, and that is on the channel Hope Lives 365 with Pastor Mark Finley. Now, you go on to the Mr. Beat video at about 9 minutes 45 seconds in, and you will see him talk about how the Northern, the Northern troops at the Battle of Bull Run, the first battle, they retreated. He doesn't really explain why, and in fact, other historians and commentators have said this is a real mystery because there was no real explanation for them to retreat. But in the Mark Finley video, around 9 minutes and 30 seconds in, he quotes from a man named Blackford, a historian who was there that day. Blackford's looking at the troops. Everything is well ordered, everything is going smoothly, and they are winning the battle. And then he looks away, and in that moment, when he looks back, literally like that, it's all confusion. And there's no explanation why, no human explanation why. I'm going to give you an explanation why from a spiritual angle, and I'm going to plainly and clearly tell you, this is from my own religion. I do believe it 100%. I assume you're not from my own religion, and so I give you permission. If you don't want to believe it, you don't have to. But... I'm telling you this story not to really prove anything in the way of my religion versus any other religion. I'm simply using it as an example for 
this overall question to illustrate the point, how does the idea of God and God's will and fate and things like that, how does that play in with human free choice? What kind of options do we have in this life for alternate timelines, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of entire nations? Book. The Great Visions of Ellen White. Roger W. Kuhn, he lists 10 particular notable experiences she had, and he's talking about the U.S. Civil War and an explanation for the Battle of Bull Run. So background, she's in a church in Michigan in 1861. God gives her a vision, says, a war is coming. Here's how Kuhn wrote it. And this is page 79. Just read you a few quotes. After coming out of vision, Mrs. White addressed the congregation, according to eyewitness Lowborough, and said, There is not a person in this house who has even dreamed of the trouble that is coming upon this land. People are making sport of the succession ordinance of South Carolina. But I have just been shown that a large number of states are going to join that state, and there will be a most terrible war. Now reading on page 80. When Ellen White received her first vision of the U.S. Civil War on January 12, 1861, she, as everyone else in the nation, was aware that South Carolina had seceded from the Union 23 days earlier. However, she may or may not have known of the secession of Mississippi, Florida, and Alabama during the three days immediately preceding her vision at Parkville. Obviously, back then, 1800s, news traveled slow, no satellites, no internet back then. So, he's continuing here. It matters little, however, for the firing on Fort Sumter by the Confederate forces, generally considered by American historians as the opening of the Civil War, was exactly three months future from the day of this vision. So Kuhn here, in his book, he lists seven different points that basically God showed to Ellen White. And one, slavery was a sin. Two, God was using the U.S. Civil War to punish both sides. The South, of course, for having slavery, but the North for not doing enough to stop slavery. He lists a few other points, but I'll just go with point seven here. By far the most amazing revelation in this vision concerned the mysterious and disastrous battle at Manassas Junction, Virginia. This battle is known in Union military circles as the First Battle of Bull Run. Among Confederates, it is known as the First Battle of Manassas. So page 84, while both North and South suffered horrendously large casualties, at one point the North was pushing ahead. When an angel descended from heaven to the battlefield and waved his hand backward, Instantly, there was confusion in the ranks. It appeared to the northern men that their troops were retreating, when it was not so in reality, and a precipitate retreat commenced. This seemed wonderful. And he's in brackets here, amazing to me. Again, 1800s language was a little different there. Kuhn is quoting from one of Ellen White's books. Now, her angel explained to her that God had this nation in his own hand and would not suffer victories to be gained faster than he ordained. The North was not to be allowed to win a quick, decisive battle, thus ending the war abruptly, because it was to be punished for condoning slavery before the war and also for not making abolition the principal ethical issue in the war. Whether or not you believe anything that I've just said is true, I am not interested in debating you. It's simply an example. An example of this idea of the interplay between free choice and God's will. What can we learn from this story? Well, number one, black lives do matter to God. Okay, let's do that. And a few other things. As we saw in the book there, the South was not going to win. 
So there is a limit to this idea of alternate history. There is a time in life as we go on with our choices that we make in which God does things to tweak history in that of nations, in that of individuals as well. How many people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, you say, you know, what was your life been like? Give me an update on, on, on how things have been going. They might turn around and tell you a story that, well, I was 20 years old, I went into university, and I had this particular career in mind, then this, this, and this happened, and I wound up here. And they're doing something totally different. You have free choice tomorrow morning what you want to eat for breakfast. Toast or cereal. But when you come to turning points in your life, when extreme coincidences happen, and it's so obvious there's a, a train of thought before you, a, a life experience waiting for you, a choice to make that will open up some new door, whether you make it or not, God has engineered that experience, but he's still giving you a choice. You see, the angel held back the troops that moment, but that didn't mean every single individual soldier was being guided by an angel to point his gun at exactly the right way. You see, he tweaks history. He tweaks your life, but he still gives you free choice. Now, when you think about it, what started with the Civil War really didn't end until the Civil Rights Act was signed by President Lyndon Johnson. It mirrors the way we needed a gradual process for the U.S. and U.K. to become friends. We needed a gradual process to fully free the slaves. So people say, where is God when all this suffering is happening in the world? Well, it's not that it's God doing all these things to, to cause all these bad things to happen. It's that people are so pig-headed and stubborn that they can only change so much in, in one particular generation. On the course, just like the, the monarch butterfly, over the course, the flow of history, generation by generation by generation, that's how changes happen that stay permanent in the world. Now, I mentioned I was going to just briefly touch on a few of Cody's other videos. Um, he did some, some great stuff on the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War, which was basically the same war and two different continents. Now, I don't know what happened to my copy of Canadian History for Dummies. I know it's in the house somewhere, but I can't find it. But I know in that book somewhere, they have a quote from Henri Bourassa, which talks about that if the French had won in the um, French and Indian War, and they had kept Quebec, that Napoleon basically would have sold Quebec along with Louisiana to the U.S., and there'd be no French in North America today. That's another answer to the question, where is God when there's all this suffering in the world? I think when we get to heaven and look back on world history and see it from his point of view, we're going to see so many points, so many times in which what did happen was the best case scenario for the situation and that God was in it in that way. Now, I want to give you some Bible verses as well, because this is a Christian video. We're going to go back to the Bible also. So we'll go now with Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. The way to prove the Bible is on the spiritual side. To look at history, to look at the prophecies of the Bible, and to see where they comment on history. And that's how you can know that God did write that book and that it is his true holy book. Now let's go with Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. So when God makes a prophecy, he does work on his end to make it happen, even though we do have free choice in the world. Talking about, again, this tweaking of history. Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. 
Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. But here we see the conflict between history and free choice solved in that God put this one woman. She's in the right place at the right time. She had a job to do. She was shown that by someone who cared about her, who could see how obvious it was, but yet she still had a choice to make. God works in every generation. Those who follow him, they do end up fulfilling the positive side of his prophecies. But if you make a negative choice, you reject him, you reject his prophecy, you don't do what he wants you to do in life. And if you continue that way and never turn back, you'll end up, despite yourself, fulfilling the same prophecy, but you'll do it on the negative side. That's what happened with the Jewish leaders who rejected Jesus. Christ was going to die on the cross. Those who put him on the cross were the ones who didn't believe in him. Those who accepted the cross, accepted Christ, were the ones who benefited from his offer of salvation. Now, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. God does exist, and Satan does exist. Angels exist, demons exist, and they are working in this same stream of time. And God's ultimate goal that he's working toward, the goal that he's going to achieve, is world peace. But not the kind of world peace that we see from the protesters today. Not the peace offered us by Star Trek and other science fiction franchises. It's a brand new world where those who love him, those who believe in him, will live with him forever. I want to ask you for your choice today. Would you like to accept Jesus as your Savior if you have already? Would you like to ask him to lead you further in your life? I'll offer you other videos on my channel that hopefully will help you with your faith. And I pray that he will be with you. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside and we behold above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay of human interest and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will.